Good evening. Welcome to Ron Frame. This is number 26. We're looking into the lives of those men and women listed in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. It's commonly called the roll call of the faithful. And we're looking into their lives because we want to see how it is that they came to be included in that illustrious list. We've already discussed Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And this session is Abraham, and we are in part five of the life of Abraham. When we close the last session, you may remember that Shedoliomer, the king of Shinar, had teamed with four other kings, with three other kings, kings of his allies and came all the way from Babylon to make war with the kings of the five cities just south of the Dead Sea. Those five cities were Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela. Lot, Abraham's nephew, had separated himself from Abram by this time and was living near the city of Sodom, and he was taken prisoner with all the others that had lost the battle, and Shadow Laomer was taking all of the spoils, all of the prisoners, and all of the captured people from those five cities, and going to carry them back to Babylon. You may remember that one person escaped from the capture of Shedda Laomer. And that person found his way to Abram and told him what had happened. Upon receiving the news, Abram immediately assembled 318 of his trained servants. That would be servants that were trained by him and they were born in his uh, own household and he led those 318 men as they chased after Shadow Laomer. Abram caught up with those who were taking the captives back in the city of Dan just that's the northernmost city in the country of Canaan or what later becomes Canaan and he devised a plan. It took a few days to execute that plan. But when they got to Damascus, Abram and his 318 men were able to overthrow those kings that had come from Babylon, from the country of Shinar. They executed the kings and they released all of the prisoners, all of the captives, and brought them back along with the spoils. And when Abram and his servants returned, the king of Sodom and the king of Salem, which was Melchizedek, came out to meet him in the valley just below Jerusalem. Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High God, it is said, had brought bread and wine, and he blessed Abram. And Abram made an offering to him, a tenth of all of the spoils that they had brought back. The king of Sodom offered a reward to Abram, but he refused that reward. And except for the amount that was given to Melchizedek and the share to which his 318 men were entitled, all the rest of those spoils, along with the rescued servants, all of the captives, including Lot, went back to their homes. <clears throat> Some believe it was because of Abram's returning the people and the spoils 
that provided Lot with a, a lot better esteem than he had prior to that war. I don't know if that's true or not. This session, though, that we're about to go into begins in Genesis chapter 15, where it is recorded in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. After these things, some believe differently, but it appears that these things refer to all of those things that we just have reviewed, the, the taking back of the captives from those five cities uh, just south of the Dead Sea, along with the spoils and all of that. Particularly, though, perhaps the defeat of Shedo Leoma. Certainly, I believe the encounter of Melchizedek is included in that. Melchizedek is probably the most intriguing character that the Bible says almost nothing about. He is mentioned in three books of the Bible, but without any new information. But that doesn't stop us from wondering just who he is and maybe speculating somewhat about who he might be. Perhaps it might be a good idea just to take a three or four minute time out and discuss what we do know about Melchizedek. In the entire Bible, the only appearance of Melchizedek is the one that we've just talked about. In Genesis 14, where it is said that he is the king of Salem, a priest of God Most High, and he comes out to meet Abram in the valley just below Jerusalem. Since Abram was not a resident of Jerusalem, and since Jerusalem was not a part of that war that went on between the five kings of the city south of the Dead Sea and the four kings that came from, from, from uh, Shinar in that area, Babylon. Actually, Melchizedek had no reason to come out and meet Abram and his men. But he did come out. And it appears from the way things are, uh, went when that happened that he really wanted to come out to meet Abraham. That is, it looks like that he made a, a uh, uh, effort, if you will, to cross paths with Abram as Abram returned from defeating the kings of Shinar. Not only just to meet Abram, but Melchizedek brought bread, wine, and a blessing that he gave to Abram when he said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. We should not overlook the fact that Melchizedek recognized Abram as a follower of Jehovah. So who was this Melchizedek? <clears throat> what does it mean when it, he is described in Genesis 14 as the king of Salem? and a priest of the Most High God. According to several sources, the term Salem is referring to Jerusalem's former name. And therefore, it is thought that Melchizedek was the leader of the city of Jerusalem, maybe the high priest of that city. In fact, that's what Josephus believed and recorded in his Antiquity of the Jews. But others say that Salem means peace, and so Melchizedek should be considered to be the king of peace, a peaceable man, one who sought peace wherever he might go. A few even believe Melchizedek was the chief leader among the people, the descendants of Ham. I kind of doubt that. 
and still others say that Melchizedek may have been Jesus himself. Again, I doubt that. And the reason I doubt that is because of the way Jesus and Melchizedek are compared to each other elsewhere. But standing against the views of the commentators is the Jewish tradition that proposes Melchizedek is in reality Shem, the son of Noah, a survivor of the great flood, in fact, the only survivor at this time. All others have died. And certainly the expression of him being a, a priest of the Most High God would fit with Shem, the last living survivor of those who escaped the flood. However, that can't be true. And the reason for that is because we have a record of the genealogy of Shem. We have discussed Shem when we covered the life of Noah. We know who his mother and father were. We even know when he was born and where. Whereas one of the puzzling things about Melchizedek is his lack of genealogy. There is no scripture to be found telling of his mother, his father, or any offspring. There's nothing more written. The writer of the Hebrew letter makes a big deal out of the fact that there is no genealogy of Melchizedek. He contrasts the, necess the necessary lineage-based priesthood of Aaron with that of Melchizedek, who has no recorded birth or death or anything else. That's in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 3 through 8. And finally, there are some who believe Melchizedek was just a common, ordinary priest who worshipped Jehovah. However, I'm pretty sure he was more than that. In Hebrews chapter 7, it is said of him that he was the king of righteousness. Because of that rendering, many have come to the conclusion that the phrase king of Salem in Genesis 14 is just another way of describing Melchizedek as a priest of Jehovah before there was a Levitical priesthood. And that's, that statement is certainly correct. That this incident occurred several hundred years before the law was given on Mount Sinai and the Levitical priesthood was organized. There are other passages that mention Melchizedek. He is mentioned in Psalm 110, verse 4, where the coming Savior, Jesus Christ, is being talked about there. And the psalmist says that Jehovah hath sworn and will not repent that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 6, where, Hebrew, where the Hebrew writer is discussing Jesus as well. And he refers to that very same quote in Psalms 110. In fact, it's almost word for word. And then uh, one chapter later, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20, we see again that very same reference, always the reference back to Psalms 110. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And in each instance, they're speaking of Jesus the Christ being a priest in the order of, or like the order of, Melchizedek. In Hebrews chapter 7, we find a whole chapter that is devoted to discussing the priestly order of Melchizedek. The purpose of that chapter is to show us how both Jesus and Melchizedek are shown to be better than the Levitical priesthood and Jesus even better than all. 
Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek simply means he is a priest in the manner of, which we understand to mean he's not a part of the Levitical priesthood, but he's much, much greater than that. Then, as quickly as he appeared, Melchizedek disappears. And except for the verses we just mentioned, we hear nothing more about him. After Abram's encounter with Melchizedek, Abram returned to his home in Hebron. And not long after that, God appears to him in a vision. You already know that while Abram was a young man, still in Ur of the Chaldees, but after he had taken his half-sister, Sari, for his wife, God appeared to Abram and gave him a threefold promise. He told Abram that he would be blessed abundantly with land. He told Abram that he would be the father of a great nation of people. And he told Abram that the whole world would be blessed because of him. The only condition attached to that threefold promise was he must leave his father's family and go to a land that he had never seen. Abram didn't leave immediately. Instead, he waited until his father, Terah, died. I'm sorry, he waited until Terah was ready to go with him to Canaan, and they did leave Ur of the Chaldees and travel to Haran, the city uh, much further to the north and to the east, uh, to the west, than Ur. And there they stayed until Terah died. While they were there, Abram acquired a, a great amount of wealth. And then after Terah died, God appeared to Abram again a second time. That's what we found recorded in Genesis chapter 12. And he makes the same promises. He repeats his promises that he made to Abram. And Abram did leave then. He was 75 years old when he left to run. But he took Lot with him. We find now the period that we're talking about when God appears to, to Abram in the plains of Mamre there near his home in Hebron, that Abram is 76 years old. It's taken about a year for all of these, the traveling to be done, and he gets there. And he's there as a sojourner. He has spent a little bit of time in Egypt, very little time, because of the the half-truth, I guess we could say, that he told the Pharaoh about Sari. But he has no offspring. Remember, his wife Sari is barren. Abram and Lot, though, are now separated. After the after they come back from Egypt, they, Abram and Lot find that there is some turmoil between their, their, their people who are tending to their flocks and, and all of that, and as well as with those people there in Canaan. And they decide to split up. Uh, we talked about the story, and I'm sure you remember how Lot chose to, to live near Sodom. And Abram took the opposite of what Lot chose, which was the west side of the Jordan River, where Lot had chosen the eastern side. And Abram is there, 
By now, he has separated himself from Terah's family. Lot no longer is living with him and, and associated with him. And so, God appears to Abram and tells him that he is not to worry. But Abram does worry. He reminds God that he has no natural heir. He says when he dies, all that he has is going to go to a steward, which is a man from uh, Damascus, the very same city in which Abram had killed Shedo Leoma. And, and just as a side note, I want you to notice the text on the screen. The expression that is used in, in Genesis chapter 15 in verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of Jehovah came unto Abram in a vision. What I want you to, to be aware of is, this is the very first appearance of that phrase. It is a phrase that is often repeated throughout the Bible, sometimes with a variation which might say the word of the Lord. But in each case, it is the same Hebrew phrase, the word of Jehovah. It's interesting to me as many times as we will run across that as we read through the Old Testament, even a little bit in the New Testament, that the very first time that phrase was used was in this particular vision that God provides Abram. We see in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 4 that this phrase is immediately used where God tells him that the steward will not be his heir. He ne Abram need not worry about that. His heir is going to come from his own loins. And he, God, repeats the promise to Abram, the land promise and the descendant promise, but being as numerous as the stars. And Abram believes God. And chapter 4 says, or chapter 15, I'm sorry, says that because Abram believed God, it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. That is to say, it was the same as righteousness. The very incident is referred to in Romans chapter 4. And it is the point when God tells Abram of the future, the bondage, the offspring, the, the period there in Egypt that kind of cements the people together. And then they're wandering in the wilderness. God reveals all of that to Abram. And then God makes a covenant with Abram. He says, tells Abram that all that he has promised will come to pass. And this land will be given to him, but to his seed not to him personally. All the land that is now occupied by the Canaanites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, I can't pronounce half of those, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephims, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, and Jebusites. And then, as chapter 16 begins, Abram has told Sarai all that God had promised. 
And they tried to understand how it is that Abram would become the father of a great nation since they had no child. And no child had been born to them in the almost 50 years now that they've been married, that, that Sarai has been considered Abram's wife. But Abram had believed God. So they continue with their lives for another 10 years. They live in Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and near the end of the 10 years, still no child has been born to Abram and to Sarai. Abram is now 86 years old, and Sarai is 76. And it is at this point that Sarai announces a new plan. She tells Abram that Jehovah has restrained her from bearing children and believes that through her servant Hagar, an Egyptian handmaiden, she would, would bear him a son. Verse 2 of Genesis chapter 16 says, and Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. That is, he gave in. So Sarai gave Hagar to Abram to be his wife. Some commentators take the position that at this time, it had not yet been clearly intimated that Sarai was to be the mother of Abram's son. And since during that time period, it was a prevalent practice for a man to have more than one wife, Sarai's plan was, was justified and should not be looked upon uh, harshly. Well, I differ with that opinion. In fact, I differ with most commentators in regard to that because I believe God intended marriage to be one man with one woman for life. Remember, God only created one Eve for Adam. And he is the one that said, For this cause should a, a man leave his parents and cleave to his wife. He did not say wives, plural. And right now, we're about to witness exactly what happens when there is more than one wife in a family. There are hard feelings. There are conflicts that occur between the two wives. Once Hagar had become pregnant, she began to, to despise Sarai, her mistress. Sarai, in response, began to mistreat Hagar. The result of that is that Hagar fled out into the wilderness. And Sari recognizes her error and she goes to Abram and tells him what she's done, admits that she was wrong by giving him Hagar, and she tells him of the hard feelings that exist between the two women. And we see right there that Abram appears to have neither guilt nor love for Hagar because he says, to Sarai, you deal with her as you see fit. In the meantime, Hagar is at a fountain, I assume that's an oasis, in the wilderness, and an angel speaks to Hagar. And that angel instructs Hagar to return to Abram's camp and to submit to Sarai because, after all, she is Sarai's handmaid. The angel also tells her to name her son Ishmael because he's going to be a wild ass among people, among men. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand shall be against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. The angel was not providing a pleasing description of Ishmael, but it certainly was an accurate one. And Hagar returns to Sarai. 
13 years later, in chapter 17, verse 1, Abram's son Ishmael is 13 years old, and Abram is now 99. Here in chapter 17, I believe God appears to Abram for the seventh recorded time. There may have been some times that aren't recorded, but I believe it's the seventh time that God has appeared to Abram since that first time in Ur of the Chaldees. And one of the things that God tells him in this occurrence is that he's not any longer going to be called Abram. From this point forward, he shall be known as Abraham, which means a father of many nations. Now that's recorded in Genesis 17 in verse 5, and it is the result of Abram believing God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness in the chapter that we just looked at. The promise that he would be the father of a great nation had already been promised to him, twice at least, uh, reviewed once even after that. We first saw it recorded back in Genesis chapter 12, but up until now, at least in Abram's eyes, it has been just a promise. But at this point, it becomes a covenant between God and Abraham. Strong's Dictionary defines the word promise as declare or pronounce, rehearse or speak. And he, devi he devi defines a covenant as something fixed, certain, and sure. I suppose the most common view of a promise is that a promise is a spoken word that really is dependent upon the integrity of the person that's making the promise. Whereas a covenant, on the other hand, is a much stronger agreement than a promise because there is a contract or a condition that is expressed and there is a token given, a, a sealing, if you will, of, of that covenant. In God's eye, I don't think there's any difference. If there is a difference in God's eye, it must be minuscule and probably because of what we as humans uh, think about it. That's because God keeps every promise that he ever makes. Regardless of whether it is sealed with a sign or not, God keeps his promises, always. But recognizing our humanity, God sometimes makes his promises appear stronger in our eyes by referring to it as a covenant and sealing it with a token or a sign. An example of that is the rainbow. God made the promise to Noah that he would never destroy the earth again with water. And he placed the rainbow in the sky after a rain as a token, a sign of that promise. The token of the covenant with Abraham, though, is circumcision. Abraham, as well as every male, born throughout Abraham's generation must be circumcised in the flesh of their foreskin as the token of that covenant. God also established in the terms of his covenant that should one choose not to be circumcised, God says the uncircumcised male would be cut off from his people because he had broken the covenant of God. Also in this chapter, God gives Sarai a new name. 
He says in verses 15 and 16, Henceforth she shall be called Sarah, and I will give thee a son of her. The covenant would be established with Isaac, a son as yet not born, but would be born to Sarah. It is at this point that we see that Abraham laughed within himself. And he said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear a child? That's in Genesis 17, verse 17. God knew what was in Abraham's heart. And he reiterated that Isaac is the son of promise. And he tells Abraham that he'll be born at this very time next year. And the text says that it, God went up from Abraham. Not long after that, in the selfsame day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and every male that had been born in his house and circumcised them as well as himself. Ishmael was 13. Abraham was 99 years old. And that was done. And that brings us to the occasion where Abraham meets the three men outside his tent, as recorded in Genesis chapter 18, a chapter that can be as easy or as difficult to understand as the reader chooses to make it. Rather than delving into the various meanings and associations that are usually applied to this chapter by scholars and commentators, which usually get us so involved with who is who and what is what that we miss the real story that the chapter is trying to tell us. I'm not going to do that. My goal is to show what is actually being said in this chapter. And I believe the key to understanding this chapter is found in verse 17. For God says, Shall I hide from Abraham that which I do? Simply put, God is planning to pronounce and carry out judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The terrible things that are going on in Sodom and Gomorrah are well known by most every Bible student. The inhabitants of those cities were openly just given over to atrocious sin, and it had not escaped God's notice. Instead, it had become very grievous, verse 20 says. Jehovah says in Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, that the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they've done altogether according to the cry of it. God has personally come down to see at ground level, so to speak, just how many people in those cities are involved in this grievous sin. And if it is as widespread as he thinks it is, then he is determined to completely destroy both of those cities. But God didn't want to keep that from Abraham. It's been 20 years since Abraham had rescued Lot from Shadow Laomer just outside of, when he was captured just outside of, of the city of Sodom. Abraham is still camped among the oaks of Mamre, later called Hebron which is where Abraham chose to live after Lot chose uh, to live on the side of the plains of Sodom. And as chapter 18 opens, Abraham was sitting in the door of his tent during the heat of the day. The Hebrew term that is translated heat of the day actually literally means the period of double light. And it refers to the time when the sun is the highest or the brightest in the sky. Sometimes it's even called the height of day. It's noontime. And tradition, Jewish tradition, is 
that after eating the noon meal, there was to be a period of rest before resuming the chores of the day. Abraham then was resting after lunch in the door of his tent, in the opening of his tent. Some say he was asleep, napping, and that may be true. But he looks up and he sees three men standing near him. <coughs> Excuse me. He did not hear them walk up. He did not see them walk up. So he were, was somewhat surprised when he opened his eyes and there they stood. According to the most trusted commentators, Abraham immediately recognizes God, who is accompanied by two angels. Probably this is because of God's having appeared to him seven times, this being the seventh time. These two angels are the two men that travel on to Sodom and are greeted by Lot when they get there. But that's another story. Whether this is the account of an eighth occurrence of God appearing to Abraham, or as Kyle believes in his commentary, it's a more detailed account of the event that we've just discussed, the one in which God changed Abram's name to Abraham and told him that his son Isaac would be born, and he changed Sarai's name to Sarah, and her bearing Isaac when she was 90 years old is made known. It's uncertain whether that's really, if this is really is that same occurrence, but we definitely see Abraham recognizing Jehovah and running to him and bowing down on the ground to welcome him. And it certainly appears that Abraham was offering worship to God because he was completely prostrate on the ground. And then he offers water to wash their feet and food for them, and they agree. Abram rushed to tell Sarah that she needed to prepare ash cakes made from choice flour. And Abraham himself ran to the herd and selected a calf and gave it to a servant and and told him to prepare a choice meal. And when all was prepared, he set curds and milk and the calf before them, and he waited on them as they ate. That's Genesis 18, the first eight verses. The visitors, most likely God himself, asked about Sarah. Sarah then told Abram that Upon his turn, return, let me re, let me start this sentence over again. Most likely, God asked about Sarah, and then He told Abraham that upon his return next year, Sarah would have a son. Now Sarah is standing behind God in the doorway to the tent, and she overhears what God is saying, and she laughed within herself about the prospect of having a child at her age. This time, the scriptures say it was God who said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh at bearing a child at her age? That's not too hard for the God. And then he says he will return this very same season next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Well, if Kyle is correct in his commentary, and I'm beginning to think that he is, both chapters 17 and 18 are describing the very same event, but from different perspectives, because the same, the same things are said in both of them. The primary focus, though, is on two different things. Chapter 17 focuses more on the covenant of circumcision with Abraham dealing with the males and, and the original promises that were made to him. Whereas chapter 18 centers in on Isaac and the birth of a son to, to Abram and to Sarah, uh, to Abraham now, and Sarah uh, in about a year. Well, after eating, 
three visitors get up and they start towards Sodom. Abraham went with them a ways and during the first part of the trip, God tells Abraham why they're going to Sodom. The two angels continue on to Sodom. But Abraham, after hearing what was about to happen, asked God to remain and he pleaded with him not to destroy the city. Perhaps he's thinking of Lot. But Abraham asked God if he was going to destroy the righteous along with those that are wicked. And then he asked God if, if God could find 50 righteous people in the city, would he still destroy the city? And Jehovah said that if he found 50 righteous people in the city, he would not destroy the city. You probably already know that Abraham petitioned God again, reducing the number. And this goes on several times until they finally get to just ten people. And Abraham is asking God if he can find ten righteous people in the city of Sodom. Would he spare the city? God said he would. If you don't know the result of what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, I encourage you to read very carefully Genesis chapter 19. Because early the next morning, Abraham gets out of his bed and he goes to the place where he and, and God were, were talking and he looked out toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and all he saw was smoke rising into the sky, as if it was the smoke of a mighty furnace. God had destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because there were not even ten people that were found to be righteous in that city. But God did spare all of the righteous people. There were three. Lot and his two daughters were the only survivors. I'm going to close this session here and we'll take up in part six when Abraham settles in a new location and begins the rest of his life. You have a good evening and thank you for watching. Good night.